Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. Hi, I'm Joe Mishka from Rural Heritage Magazine, welcoming you to another episode of Rural Heritage on RFD TV. Today we're at the Forest History Center in Grand Rapids, Northern Minnesota, where they're putting on Real Horsepower Days. Teamsters from around northern Minnesota brought their horses and are demonstrating how the logs were harvested and hauled back in the day. The Minnesota Historical Society maintains sites around the state and they have agriculture sites, milling sites, and logging was a real important industry in Minnesota so they created the Forest History Center. The nature of the logging camps were that they were usually only for a season. See they got their um, stumpage, the, the companies got their stumpage and they figured out how many men, how many horses it was going to take to log that during that winter. And this, the, back in 1900, they depend on the rivers to move the logs. So often the distance from here is the Mississippi River. So, um, but the, the camps are all gone. After a season, they just disappeared. So using historical records and pictures and stuff, they recreated this logging camp, as it might have been, for a contingent of about 80 men. So this is the office. This is where the business would be Right, done. yep. yep. Well, these folks have come in to... Uh, <laughs> Oh, welcome to uh, Northwoods Number One. Um, my job here is the clerk of the camp. Now, every camp has workers. Every camp has management. Well, I'm considered one of the management here, and I keep track. You see, if these fellows wanted to sign on here. They're working on a promise. They come in and get room and board and a daily wage, depending on what they do. But they can't collect until they leave camp. And it's a, yeah, it's probably a 12 to 15, maybe 20 week season. We start in the fall, get the camp set up in October, and by the time November comes, you're hoping for a little bit of snow and frozen ground, and then you start cutting. And spring can come in the end of March, April. You want to have your cut done, you want to have all your logs on the landing. Because we depend on ice roads and horses to move the logs. So uh, that's why we're, we're doing all logging in the winter. Some of these sleds are... 25 ton moving downhill. Now you come into the camp and you sign on. Let's see here, we got a page from the book. Now it looks like our foreman here, this is secret information, so don't be spreading it around. Our foreman is making $70 a month. Paid big. But you see, he's the fellow that keeps the camp together, keeps them working, makes the assignments. And uh, he'll, be, he'll be held responsible. And if you don't get your logs to the mill, in the spring, nobody gets paid. And your scaler, the scaler is the fellow that keeps track of how much is cut. You go out there, you scale every log, you take your stamp hammer, and you put a mark in the end. This is the this is the mark for Northwoods number one. It's a dollar sign, and you mark every log, and he keeps a record, a scaler's record, so he knows at any given day where we're at in the cut. And we're trying to make seven million board feet, and that's a and if we can get an overcut, then we can make a little more money. But if we get bad snow and undercut, it could be a tough winter. But you, you know, everybody has an important job and they get paid accordingly. The scaler, he's making about 45. The clerk, myself, would be making 35. Um, and you've got uh, uh, Sawyers who are making 30 bucks a month. And their uh, job is to cut the trees into 16 foot lengths. Um, and you've got uh, uh, skidders, teamsters that are, are running horses, $35 a month. The hauling teamsters make them the same. Everybody is very specialized. And there's a fellow named the road monkey or chickadee. Probably the lowest paid, maybe $15 a month. And his job is to clean up after the horses so you don't get horses in the ice or manure in the ice roads. Um, but when that sled's coming down a hill, on two ribbons of ice on cast iron she picks up speed and the teamster hollers for uh, hey he means put some hay in there and get her slowed down especially that first run in the morning those 
that frosty ice gets pretty greasy. So, and if your horses stumble, you lose a team. It's called sluicing the team, sluicing your horses over the top. You um, came in the fall, you knew approximately where the river was, you knew where your cut was, you positioned your camp because you're, you're drawing water from the river. So you, you're not going to be digging well for one season. So you've got your river within distance so you can go down and get water for the cook shack. You can take the horses down, water them, all the things that, that you need. Um, so that's kind of how the, the camp would be positioned. <clears throat> and you'd use what available logs, tar paper. These This is probably a pretty deluxe camp in the big scheme of things. Home, sweet home. This one here is set up for, I believe, 76 lumberjacks, two more to a bunk. When you're looking for a bunk mate, you want somebody with warm toes because his head's that way, your head is this way. So, <laughs> heated by a barrel stove. When she gets, when she gets really cold out there, the stove will be glowing red when they come in at night. And the men are working daylight till dark. In the winter time, up here in the North Woods, it probably doesn't get light till about seven o'clock in the morning. But an hour ahead of that time, the uh, bull cook would come in. You know, there's daylight in the swamp. Roll out, boys. Well, the teamsters are probably already down in the barn getting the horses ready. The cookies and cook are up in the in the cook shop already making breakfast. Everybody gets out, gets themselves ready, and gets up to the to the uh, cook camp so that they can get something to eat and but when they're done with that they come back put on their winter clothes and head down to the to the cut where they're going all before daybreak come dark start to the sun's fading the dusk is setting in the men horses come back from the woods the teamsters put away their horses the men come in everything's wet you can imagine the smell of wet wool socks. just sauce. steaming like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And the bull, bull cook, he's, this is his domain. He's kind of like the camp janitor. He's keeping keeping the stoves fired and, you know, making sure there's water in for the cook shack and all of that. So, Because I'm guessing they don't bathe a lot. They don't wash their clothes a lot. Oh, heavens no. Right. You, so you'd it's got to be a Maybe on rain. Sunday you might you might boil your clothes. And you do that because there's little critters in there called graybacks and they once you get started they just multiply and you know you're you're always scratching something so but you, you kind of have some fun with the graybacks take a on Sundays gets a little tedious you get your grayback racetrack you take this and you layer out on the floor and you drop your, your graybacks and you see who's can get to the edge when they get to the edge you get them <laughs> And you're not gambling for money. You might do a chew of tobacco or something like that, but the foreman, he didn't like, don't allow any gambling, and he don't like any women in camp, and he doesn't like any alcohol in camp. All three of those things cause people to fight. Lumberjacks don't fight fair. When you wear cork boots, you use everything you got. <laughs> <laughs> and here they sharpen their tools. Yep. That was a, a sawyer, or a, a swamper, and an axe. And that was his pride and joy. And they say... It's a dull axe that'll cut you, not a sharp axe. Sharp axe will bite in. A dull axe will uh, come back and bite you. So there'd be there'd be water in here. And you have, maybe have somebody helping them out, turning it, grinding it to a fine edge, and do that every day. But sanitation was important. Wash your hands, because there are cases where you got flu, diphtheria, smallpox in the camp could wipe out a whole camp. In this type of living situation, um, kept your hands clean. And you were fed nutritious food. You know, the, the, when we go to the cook shack, you'll see what they're, what they're eating. But the men needed to have um, good food. And that's what held the camp together. If you had a bad cook, they'd go to the camp down the road. So um, you, hired, you paid your cook pretty good money, about $50 a month. Wow. Yep. So, and this is what they call the dingle for storing the for the the cook the cooks to have um, supplies stored here. It's called a dingle. Dingle. Yep. Hi, Miss Rebecca. Hello. Okay, meet our cook, Miss Rebecca. 
Oh, how do you do? Good, how are you? Uh, the good food good. we have here. Oh my goodness, yes. And lots of it, probably close to 350 pounds of food. You'll consume somewhere around four to 5,000 calories a day. You must be a celebrity in camp. Oh. Very popular. Well, my cooking is. Okay, right. Not necessarily me. <laughs> we wouldn't want to get on your bad side, I'm sure. Well, I do have rules. First, when you uh, arrive in the camp and you've told me that you are going to sign up, I'm going to ask you what your job is, and then I assign you a place to sit. So you can see in here, there's room for 76. We're just about to set up some of the tables now, but uh, everybody will have their spot to sit. So as soon as we blow this Gabriel horn here hanging on the wall, that will tell the men that it's time to come in and eat. And they will come in like a pack of wild grizzlies that haven't eaten all winter when it comes to breakfast. So we blow the horn, they come in, they sit down, they shut up, they eat, and they get out. And they're here about 15 minutes or so. The only time they are allowed to talk is if one of the dishes that's loaded up with food in the middle of the table goes empty. And then they raise us up in the air and they yell for what it is that they want <laughs> refilled in here. And then I get one cookie for every 25 men, and my cookies are my helpers. And I have a couple of lady cookies this year, Miss Abigail, you might see her wandering around, uh, Crazy Mary as well as Hank. And us ladies, this is where we bunk back over here. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not real warm back there. In fact, this time of the season, if you put your bo uh, boots too far underneath the bunks there, they may be frosted right to the floor by morning. You don't have a stove in here to keep you warm? No, the only stove that goes throughout the night now is this barrel stove over here. Sure. Not even my cook stoves will go through the night because it takes such amount of uh, small firewood to keep right, them going. Right. And the bull cook will keep that one going, however, for us, so we don't have to get up. But chances are we're going to be sleeping next to it anyways. It's a little warmer there. So then uh, your breakfast is going to be the largest meal of the day. It will consume of uh, about 500 pancakes, sourdough pancakes. We call them sweat pads. So I should start there. The men are going to call everything different than what you're used to hearing. So they will have 500 sweat pads. They'll have saw belly fried in the oven, uh, oatmeal, wind timber at every meal, spuds at every meal, log and berries at every meal, blackjack and swamp water to wash down cold shut sticky buns or skid roads. What's wind timber? The beans. Okay. Not right. the green sure. ones. Okay, right. Uh-huh. Right. Hence the name. Uh-huh. And log and berries, those are prunes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, just a fancy name for prunes. The blackjack and swamp water is coffee or tea. We don't take the time to dig a well out here. So our, our, uh, my cookies are going to run down to the river and haul water up using this yoke and a couple of buckets here. And this is for washing dishes. This takes about 10 trips to load that up. And that'll go empty every time they do two hours worth of dishes after each meal. But that pipes right through my stove here. Okay. It's a little bigger than a reservoir would be on cook stoves. Right. And so I also have to boil the water on the stove, about five gallons a meal for the blackjack. That's what the coffee is. And uh, about three gallons get boiled up on the stove for the swamp water, which is the tea. So you'll get that at every meal. The desserts, however, those are going to be what the men might even start with first to dish up. Uh, for breakfast, you're going to have uh, a choice of cold shuts. Those are uh, temporary chain links that the men carry in their pockets. So it's round with a hole in the middle, just like donuts. Now, because I need to make sure that you have a certain amount of prunes throughout the day, for breakfast, it's a good place to disguise them into the sticky buns, you know, caramel rolls. You can put thick layers of that caramel throughout those uh, sticky buns and hide a lot of prunes right inside of there. Same with the, uh, well, the skid roads. Those are cinnamon rolls. Put a nice thick layer of frosting right on top of that, an icing, 
And uh, they never look under there to see how many prawns are in there as well. You must get up pretty early in the morning. To get the About sun three hours before daylight. Yeah. And then we go to bed somewhere around two, three hours after sun town. Wow. And it's a not a lot different than some. It might be a little earlier in the morning when you live on the farm, but chances are two, three hours after sundown in the middle of winter, people are still awake. Your day doesn't end just because it went dark. So this here is the oven. And, uh, these are the size of my bread pans. I can fit uh, six loaves in each one of these. I have four of these. And that all four fit right into one oven. Well, and this is the firebox here. Sure. And that's where you take the ashes out beneath it. Yep. And the blacksmith made me one of these for my pies. Pie lifter. Yeah. I can put the plate right on top here, and I can reach clear to the back. And I can fit 10 pies in each oven. Wow. So they're constantly getting rotated around. So Because so there's hot spots pop. and cool spots. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh -huh. oh, those are beautiful. They are. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Good to meet you. Glad you're here today. Me too. What is the mission of the center? Well, we are an environmental history and learning center. Um, the living history that you're experiencing today has been a core experience, particularly in the summer, for 40 years here. But we also do naturalist programs, we do folk school programs, we do um, wildlife engagement programs. Um, we're prototyping currently a um, kayaking and um, fat tire bike sort of naturalist program that we're, that we're experimenting with. Um, and so our mission is really to connect people to forests and to share the history of, of the importance of forests um, to cultures here in Minnesota particularly, that's what we focus on. Timber uh, or forests in, in Minnesota have been a major resource. Um, uh, of course, we had wheat, you know, um, and iron ore and fur, you know, those were, were big resources historically, but the forests today are still very, very important uh, to the economy, but also to, you know, our lives in terms of recreation. We have forested communities all over northern Minnesota, which are very special. Um, so it's a complex story, but it's a, it's a really neat one. People um, are, are really getting into um, the ecology and naturalist aspects. I see a lot more people um, working on bird counts and bird banding, um, a lot of photography these days. Um, people are really getting into um, kayaks and canoeing and, and fat tire biking is uh, really coming into its own. Um, we have a, a new Tioga trail system that they've been raising money for here over in the Cohasset area, a new park for mountain bikes and fat tire bikes. Um, they, they raised the money to build that, some $3 million just like that because it was such a popular idea. And they're going to take an old uh, mining site and, and turn it into a recreation site for, for bikers. And so that's a really neat thing. And we have the Masabi Trail system here, which is fabulous. Um, and so in the winter, we all enjoy snowmobiling and ice fishing and skiing. We're, we, we ski here on this site. We groom the trails for skiing and fat tire bikes. We do snowshoeing, dog sledding. Um, you know, and so we love winter as much as we do the summer months, but... You kind of have to. You do, yep. Yeah. It's a really special place to live up here, though. Yeah. In some years past, we've had smaller um, numbers of horses here. Um, thanks to Dwayne Barrow and Ed Nelson and others, they've um, sort of reinvigorated the program and, and added a lot to it. This year we brought in a, uh, we, UPM Blandin generously donated a truckload of logs um, and the, the, the fellows spent yesterday dispersing the logs all over the woods to create more of a realistic scene. Um, and we haven't done that in years past. Um, so they're actually working in two different places here in camp, unloading logs from a wagon and up in a meadow and in, next to a plantation forest, actually loading logs onto the wagon so people get to see kind of 
It isn't exactly how it would have been historically because you would have been working with sleighs, but it gives you a sense of what it was like even though you're using a different uh, piece of equipment to transport the logs. So. I'm on hook. Uh, you can find us actually by going to um, just googling the Minnesota Historical Society and that will take you to um, the, the society's website and then there are links to us there. We're a part of the Minnesota Historical Society. We're one of 26 sites owned by the society. They're one of the largest organization or historical societies in the country. And um, so you can link up and get to our page very easily by doing that, so. Back, 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 boom. Major Matt, step, 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 ho! Now those horses can pull more than three logs. I'm quite sure that. I think the wagon with the limb thing. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information. Or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.